Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Russ Scanlon, and I'm here with Dr. Benjamin Lyle, who is our stroke team medical director uh, for Cox Health. And he is here and gracious enough to give us a presentation to our regional first responders and uh, is going to teach us about stroke care. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Lyle. Sure. You can take your mask off once I step away from you. Okay. Very good. Yeah, like you said, uh, I'm Dr. Lyle. Um, I'm originally from the Ozarks. <clears throat> I came here in August and took over as a uh, medical director of the Comprehensive Stroke Center at Cox South, uh, and then have since, um, you know, we've we've expanded our, our telestroke uh, footprint there some as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, I'm originally from the Ozarks, so I'm just very excited to be back in this area. You know, I just think the people here are special, and uh, we have a responsibility to the best we can to give them, you know, the best stroke care. And no doubt about it, uh, EMS is a big part of that. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about time in acute stroke care, and I'll try to add in as much that's practical and relevant for you guys as I can uh, during this time. Um, so I have no financial disclosures to disclose. Uh, you know, like I said, the short version of my biography, I was, I was raised in a, in a little town called Huntsville, Arkansas. I grew up on a farm there. And then I went to medical school at the University of Arkansas. Um, and I did my neurology residency at Wake Forest and then a, a stroke fellowship there as well and came in August. Um, so, you know, I want to overview what's important in terms of the time markers for stroke care and especially in our region, how those are specific to what we do. Uh, and then if, if time permits, we can go over some basic stroke information in cases um, as time admits. But certainly if there are questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer those to make this as, as relevant and practical to you guys as I can. So what time means for stroke? If you'll, you know, I'm a neurologist and I also have a, a, a PhD in English, so you'll, you'll bear with me as I talk about <laughs> two different words for time, because I think this is important. And, uh, and I think EMS of all people, EMTs, um, you know, every, can understand this and appreciate it. So there's two words for time uh, that the Greeks had. We just kind of have one, but the meaning's important here. There's chronos, chronological time. And uh, this was always, the Grim Reaper was uh, kind of, what you know uh, was what they used to to personify this. Um, one second is always a second. You know, there's there's a 60 seconds in a minute. These are all the same. You know, it took a long amount of time. We use that expression. So uh, you know, we have four and a half hours to get somebody TPA. That's how long we have. So that's one idea about what we mean by time. The second they had when they would sit, talk about time was one called Kairos. So this is really important for stroke and for what you do in general. Not all seconds are created equal. Not all minutes are created equal. You know, in terms of acute care, we have certain minutes that are the most crucial. And certainly um, in terms of stroke care, you know, the five minutes at the end of the four and a half hours for TPA administration are not nearly as important as the first five minutes. Uh, and the same is true of, of everything that goes along the line with stroke. So stroke is all about uh, seizing the moment when we can and making sure the whole system from start to finish from the family, the community, the EMT, to the emergency department, uh, to neurologists, hospitalists, uh, and physical therapy and all those steps along the way are involved in doing things as fast as possible and understanding that the most important time is, 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 the most, is uh, early on. You know, we can never make up for that later. And, uh, and so this, you know, would I, if I were to talk to a bunch of neurologists, as a stroke neurologist, they think we, we move too fast. We, you know, we, there's a certain, uh, a certain kind of a picture of that, but certainly talking to EMS, we're on the same page, you know. So we're, we're cut from the same cloth. Um, and so when we talk about this, we're talking about Kairos, those first few minutes, those are the times we have to seize. You know, the next two weeks after a stroke, you just can't do the things you can do initially. Um, and, and that's been the case, uh, you know, since we've had acute treatments for stroke and very little has changed. So, so what are the important um, times, both chronological and then, um, and then the ones and times of the moments we have to see? So for you guys, probably the most important thing uh, that I'll say in this whole presentation for you to be able to help us with stroke care is to go over this concept of what last known normal means. And a lot of you have a really good idea of this and, and do a good job. Um, and so whenever you come, you know that 
when you come into to Cox South, for example, I'll be there waiting uh, when you guys get there, whether it's coming off of the helicopter or the ambulance. And the first question I ask, and the most important one that we'll ask during that is, what is the last known normal? This is extremely important. And so what is the last known normal? It's the last time someone could say without, with absolute certainty that that patient was normal. It's not when the symptoms seem to come on or, or when they found them. And so that, that distinction is really important. So let's say someone, um, you know, a lot of you will know this already, but let's say someone went to sleep at 9 p.m. on the night before and they woke up with the symptoms the next morning. It's important to know that the last known normal was last night at 9 as opposed to waking up with those symptoms being okay and then having them happen that next morning. Uh, so that is crucial. If the patient hasn't been seen for two days, they live on their own and a neighbor found them, you know, the last known normal would be two days ago. And, and why is that important? It's important because TPA is not very dangerous for an average person. We all could, our body produces it all the time. We all could take TPA right now, be, be fine. Um, but the reason why TPA becomes dangerous is because whenever you have a stroke, your body is going to react to that. The blood vessels <clears throat> will dilate to get blood around the area where there's a blockage. So you will get blood vessels that are maximally dilated. And then you also get the blood pressure that goes up. I mean, this is, every time you see a stroke, you know, the blood pressure, you guys come in, it's 220, it's 190. You know, you, you know this, this is what you see. The body is trying to increase the blood pressure to increase the cerebral perfusion pressure, how much blood is getting to the brain. And so what you have, when you have a stroke, the body is doing everything it can to save that tissue. So you have blood vessels that are maximally dilated. They cannot dilate anymore. You have a blood pressure that is as high as the body can safely get it. And then the reason why you bleed after TPA is not because the blood vessels burst because the TPA causes them to burst, but it's because you got a blood clot, all right? And you know, you think about, you got a pipe here, several pipes or whatever, and all the blood's supposed to go through the big one, but that's blocked. So then it goes through the others and they dilate as much as they can. Now, if we go and we break up that clot with TPA, all the blood suddenly rushes through where it was supposed to be going. Those blood vessels are already maximally dilated. The blood pressure is already up. That blood vessel ruptures and you get a hemorrhage and a bad outcome. So this is why the last of normal is so important because if you give this medication and it's, you know, we, the last of normal is unreliable or, or we, we just couldn't, we couldn't tell and we do this or we've gotten some bad information from, from the family or from bystanders or whatever, then that is where we can get into trouble. So that's extremely important. So a couple of very uh, key cases to look at here. Right MCA strokes. So someone's weak on the left, weaker in the arm than the leg. They're kind of looking this way. They have what we call neglect of the left hemi body. Those strokes are characterized by something called anisognosia. So what's anisognosia? Anisognosia is the inability of the person who's had the stroke to be aware of those deficits. So, see, you'll have heard this story, I think, before. Someone is in a car wreck. You guys get called, you go out there, you pull them out of the car wreck, and you go, man, they're looking this way, they're not recognized the side of their body, they're weak, and so they must have had a stroke right then and had the wreck. Well, often that's not the case because the patient is totally unaware of those. They had anisognosia, so we see this frequently. A right MCA stroke, patient doesn't know they have the deficits, they try to drive, they have a wreck because they can't see this half of the world. So in that case, it's really important to find out, well, when is the last time somebody else saw them okay, especially with a right MCA stroke? So that's the one where we really are cautious and, and that makes me very nervous and, and we really try to nail that down. So especially with a stroke, Someone's weak in the left arm, weak on the left side in general, right gaze preference. They may not know they've had a stroke. And those, in, in the studies and then what we see practically, are the ones that could potentially have a bad outcome from TPA because they've got a pretty big stroke. And then we, the patient doesn't know when they're last known normal. So we may get some misleading information. So that last known normal is really important. Um, it's the most important piece of information we can have about that patient. And so if you come in and you tell me blood sugar, blood pressure, and last no normal, then that, that's, there's only one other piece of information I'd want. And that's the contact information for the family. 
so that we can try to call them and, and confirm that if there are questions and get a hold of them. And uh, by and large, you guys do a great job with getting us that information. And, uh, and so those are the pieces of information to get that last known normal because it's the most important thing uh, we, we can know. And then if we need to clarify, we can call the family and talk to them. And also we need to get assent to give TPA as well. We don't have to have a formalized consent, but we do need to talk to somebody if the patient's not able to consent us. And, and that's true in most often the case with strokes that would be debilitating enough to get TPA. So that's it, last known normal. So what other times? Um, you know, the next one is four and a half hours. And so four and a half hours is how long from their last known normal we have to get them TPA. Okay, and so, you know, the one who was 9 p.m. last night normal, we obviously can't administer TPA in that case. So we have four and a half hours. Now, it's very kind of, everything has to work perfectly for us to be able to do this. The family's got to recognize there's a stroke or the patient. You guys get out there, recognize what's going on, get them to us fast. And then also once they're in the hospital, there are a few pieces of information we have to have too that take some time. So we have to have a, a scan of their brain of some type. We have to know a blood sugar, a blood pressure. That's essentially all we need to know in the last known normal. Then we can proceed. Okay. But that four and a half hours is really crucial for us. And I'll speak about one thing that's going to be coming. Uh, we don't do this at Cox yet, but other places may begin to do this, which is tenecteplase. Um, this is another medication places are starting to use that can go up to six hours. Um, and it's just a bolus uh, as opposed to a continuous infusion. In the future, we may do that. We're still looking at um, how safe that is and, and the efficacy. And you know, the studies are limited right now. I won't go into all of that. But you're probably going to see some outlying institutions use tenecteplase. And in that case, it would be six hours. But for us, within our stroke network right now, um, we're doing four and a half hours. Okay. So here, here are all the challenges you know, that I've started to mention is <clears throat> only 4% of patients present within three hours of last known normal to the hospital of stroke patients. And that means there's a lot of people out there <clears throat> that we could potentially help if, we, if the community knows how to recognize a stroke, the family knows how to recognize a stroke, um, <clears throat> you know, you guys understand this and, and, and get them here and we can get all that information. So really there's plenty of opportunity really without spending a lot, a lot of money or having new resources or anything, if we can really just focus on the, the, the big, important, high-yield things here. So <clears throat> we're trying to get that number up in our region uh, with education in the community um, and with education of providers. So, you know, in terms of TPA, it's one of the most established, um, you know, medications that, that's been used and, uh, you know, revolutionized acute stroke care, you know, in the 90s there. So um, it's, they've had several trials that have shown the efficacy. The bleeding risk is about 6%. Um, and so this is how we counsel patients. Those are usually patients with strokes, with larger strokes. Like I said, usually right MCA where they're later on, uh, you know, from that four and a half hours. Uh, or maybe we thought it was four and a half hours and it wasn't. So if you look at the trials, those are the ones who are most likely in the subgroup analyses to have bleeding. So, you know, that's kind of the danger and the way we can avoid that is to really get a good history um, and take a good look at the imaging. So there is a shortage <laughs> of just about every kind of healthcare provider. Um, and there is a, a huge shortage in terms of neurologists. And so you're going to see a lot of people taking care of strokes that aren't, that aren't neurologists and that's fine. Hey, you know, the ED does a great job here. You know, and one of the things I'm the most excited about is helping emergency physicians in this region who don't have neurology do a really good job with stroke care, and they absolutely do. Uh, you know, I think, you know, you, if you went to Barton County and said, someone comes in with a stroke care, do they, get, do they get great stroke care? They absolutely do. And so we want to help each of those places do as good a job as they can. And so just to kind of talk about what we've set up in terms of our infrastructure here. You know, Cox South is the only comprehensive uh, stroke center in the, in the Southwest Missouri. And, you know, we do uh, teleneurology in its entirety for Branson, Monette, and Barton County. Branson and Monette are primary stroke centers. Barton County is, is going to get their primary certification uh, this year. They've started giving TPA. 
we started working with them doing telestroke. So this is the infrastructure you'll see around after you drive the patients off. In most of the hospitals, they will call a neurologist, will beam in on a telehealth device, um, and then we'll help give them recommendations on TPA. And so that's, that's kind of how we leverage our limited resources in terms of neurology to the region. So we've expanded that. <clears throat> now Barton County, we offer those services there. And all of the studies show that you give more TPA if that's the case. And so now they're going to end up being a primary stroke center. And I want you guys to understand how important what you do is and how important it is what those primary stroke centers do uh, that are out in critical access hospitals. All right. So if, if Barton County can't give, or, and this is just an example, any of these critical access hospitals that are the only hospital in the county, if they can't give TPA and y'all have to drive all the way through that county, how many people, you know, we're talking about 4% at best, how many people then can't get TPA, right? Because they have to drive all the way even through that county to be evaluated. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of good, hardworking people out in out there who don't have access to that so what we're trying to work with and you guys are a big part of is getting as many places to do a really good job at stroke as possible not just cox south and so barton county is going to be able to do that we also have an agreement now with cmh where you know and we've set up a stroke algorithm algorithm based on their own physical architecture we do telestroke for them you know mercy has sites they do telestroke for too as well from and so the goal for everybody you know it's a team effort is to be able to have all of these places provide great stroke care. And so regardless of where you guys take the patients or where you're from, these are the th same things, last known normal, contact information, blood sugar, blood pressure. So in terms of the infrastructure, we're limited in our resources, but you know we're, we're committed to making places able to do as good a job as they can, whether I'm physically there or Dr. Paptor's physically there or whatever, you know, that those people in, in Barden County and in, in Monat and <clears throat> CMH, wherever, you know, they deserve the best stroke care they can get. So we're trying to do that. Now, you know, then we may have to transfer them into our stroke unit, but that's okay, you know, because that's not something everywhere would be able to maintain. So the number needed to treat, if you guys are familiar with some of our statistics, is how many people you have to give TPA to, to reduce mortality. And uh, our mortality statistics are very crude. It's like, can you walk without a walker or not? That's what we're talking about. So it's a sig significant difference. Three people. Three people have to get TPA to where one of them can walk without a walker, to where one of them can talk to their family, to where one of them can hear someone you know, say, I love you and know what they're saying. So that, that is a very effective treatment. Okay, so 30 minutes is another important time. <clears throat> So this is what the big, you know, DNV Joint Commission, all the accrediting bodies say, this is how fast you need to get TPA. This is your goal, okay? This is a challenge, right? Once they get to the hospital, if we know they've had a stroke, which often we do because you guys give us uh, a good heads up, then, then this is possible. But the main hindrances are, if we don't know the last known normal, we just can't give it because it's too dangerous. Once again, that's why that's so important. You know, if we don't have collateral sources to get information from. We can't talk to someone else to get assent or information. Um, and then, you know, blood pressure control sometimes, you know, the blood pressure's high, we've got to pull that down less than 185 over 110. So we have to get it down below. So those are the things that, that are often a barrier to what we can do. But 30 minutes is the goal. Really the goal though is as soon as possible. And so think about Kairos in terms of time again. The first minute they get in there is more important than the last minute before 30 minutes. So our goal is to get them TPA as fast as possible. We don't wait till it's close to 30 minutes and say, oh, we still did okay. No, our goal is to do it as fast as possible. And you, a lot of you have probably seen me and, and worked with me down there. We, we're safe, we're careful, but we move fast, okay? And so I think that's where you, and you know, EMS and, and a stroke doctor will get along as, you know, and understand each other. So why, why are the first five minutes more important than the last five minutes? I actually think this is maybe one of the most important slides um, uh, to show you this. So what I've got here, and I think this was based on, this is from a, you know, a big stroke study in Canada that tried to look at this. So if you have a stroke, you're losing every second 32,000 neurons. All right. And, uh, 
And so that's, that's huge, 230 million synapses. Um, and, you know, you're, you're aging, you know, 8.7 8 hours, you know, in that second. That's how much time is taken off of your life. Per minute, 3.1 weeks of life is lost, right? And then per hour, we're talking about years. And then per stroke, obviously, if you have a stroke, it decreases your life expectancy by 36 years. So this is why we think about time in terms of Kairos and not Kronos. The last five minutes of that four and a half hours is not the same because you've already lost, you know, 15 years potentially of your life. So this is why for us, every minute is important and we move quickly and everything is designed in this system around getting things done as quickly as possible and getting them to that acute treatment. So this, if there's one slide that just burning your brain to just remind you, you know, when someone's in the bed, why we're, we're trying to move fastly and we'll still try to be, you know, polite, professional, uh, but man, this is really important. And this is what we, you know, we, we dedicate our lives to doing. So this slide is outdated. I'll have to tell you, you know, uh, when I made this presentation, 12 minutes was the fastest time we got in a patient TPA from the time they came in the hospital to, to getting TPA. We've done it in 10 minutes now, um, and we've done it in 11 minutes. And so we, we've beaten this time twice uh, because, once again, it's not just getting it under 30 minutes, which is what the accrediting bodies care about. It's getting it to the patient as fast as possible. So 10 minutes, and everything has to work out perfectly. You all have to do a good job, ED, neurology, everyone, to get this done. And so we can do that, so, and we will do it in that fast. So we routinely have gotten it under uh, 15 minutes within you know, the past six months or so. And so I think this is our goal, and, and if everyone's you know, along the way is getting their job done, this can happen. And that's as good as it happens anywhere. So then there's another time too. So you say, okay, and this is relatively new. And so I'll, I'll go into this in a little detail. So 24 hours, this is a recent change. Maybe for some of you who've been, been around a while, 24 hours is the time we have for a patient to be eligible for a thrombectomy. And just to, to clarify, thrombectomy is, is a procedure uh, where you know, intravascular access is obtained, usually through the femoral artery, and they go up and they can pull out the clot once it's there, if, if everything is right. So this can happen within 24 hours if there's viable brain tissue. So, you know, if you see someone in the last one normals last night, we still have to keep our foot on the gas if they have a stroke, because we still can get them here <clears throat> and take care of them. Now, the vast majority of the successful cases of thrombectomy are still under six hours. So, you know, if someone has a stroke, you got to just get them here fast because, once again, the last eight hours of that 24 are not as important as the first eight. So if they get here within six hours, we can certainly uh, have a much better chance of helping them than if they get there at the last 24. So we really focus on that. So there were two big trials in the United States um, that helped establish that thrombectomy was affected, effective within 24 hours. Um, and without going in too much into the trials, but these both came out a few years ago, um, and they were just slam dunks. The number needed to treat, and you know, I haven't put all, I don't think I put all, yeah, here it is. So here's the trial information, and to give you the short of this, you know, you can see here, um, this was just astounding when it came out. The number needed to treat to keep someone out of a nursing home is somewhere between two and three for thrombectomy. And that's just, um, that's astounding, right? Uh, the, the amount of uh, people's health that we save, the amount of resources that are saved, um, you know, is, is tremendous. So number needed to treat is somewhere around 2.4 to keep someone out of a nursing home. We're not talking about subtle differences. We're talking about someone being able to walk, talk, and feed themselves. And, and that's tremendous because a lot of people, depending on where you are, you may say, I don't even... I don't even want a treatment that keeps me alive, but in a nursing home. This treatment keeps you out of a nursing home and alive, especially if you're a younger patient. And so just tremendous. And this is something that's available within 24 hours. So we have to keep our foot on the gas even up to 24 hours. And so, you know, this, this uh, you know, if you are familiar with a plot like this, this is just about as impressive a, of a study and as results as, as you can see. Now, this is relatively new. So uh, people are still getting used to this. We're still getting the word out about, about this trial and the changes and guidelines that came from it. So that number of 24 hours is extremely important to remember 
you say, well, they, ha they can't get TPA, what can we do? Still, if they have a stroke, get them to us within 24 hours, and we certainly will make sure if they're eligible for these treatments that they get them. Um, you know, and this is just another uh, slide showing that the same thing, uh, 2.8, was the number needed to treat for functional independence, all right, to save someone to, to where they can take care of themselves and don't need help. Um, and that's at 90 days. So our goal, oh, a break. Okay, we'll, we'll take a quick break after, uh, let me do this next slide, then we'll take a break because it's still on thrombectomy. So, so our goal for how quickly someone gets a thrombectomy is 60 minutes from the time they get to the hospital. So that means um, they come in, they get a scan, and then you know, they get TPA if they need it, everything gets worked out. We have to get advanced imaging, which takes a little bit longer, either a CTA, CT perfusion, or an MRI, MRI perfusion. And then we can call our interventional neuroradiologist at our institutions who does it. Sometimes it's neurology, sometimes it's neurosurgery. And then, then we can get them up there as soon as possible to get this procedure. How do we speed this up? Well, I'll tell you, one of the things we've done in terms of, you know, trying to set up a, a network in the region and get everybody you know, to work together is a lot of places will have imaging software called, called RAPID where outside hospitals will do the CT angiogram to look at the blood vessels, see if there's a large clot. Then they can, some of them can also do a CT perfusion to see if there's tissue to be salvaged. I can see all of that on my phone, even hospitals outside of our system. You know, so Freeman, um, you know, CMH, you know, I've already said, we have perfusion now at Branson. We'll eventually get it at Monette and Barton County. So if they get that imaging, they come straight to our interventional radiology. And so we can get them in less than 60 minutes in those cases much easier. So how can you guys help us with that? Well, you know, really getting them there quickly. And then the second thing, having a good story, as we said, last known normal contact information, and then having, you know, an adequate IV, which would be AC or lower, 18 gauge. Um, is what they would want in order to uh, be able to run, you know, the angiogram and then get perfusion. Uh, and so if we can do that, you know, 60 minutes, then the outcomes are really great. So this is our goal, and this is actually uh, pretty challenging to achieve, so we're doing everything possible to do that because they have to get all the way to the IR suite, you know, um, and have, you know, a catheter all the way up from their artery, to, from their artery to their brain. And so doing this in 60 minutes is a challenge, but, but that's absolutely our goal. Okay, we'll take a short break here, um, and then we'll come back and keep going, okay? Hi, uh, welcome back. So, uh, you know, we'll start where we left off, and, you know, we were, had just finished uh, talking about thrombectomy in the time window, just 24 hours, but once again, our goal is as soon as possible. Um, so we can pull the slides back up, yeah. So... The other, the other thing we, we also have that's a time frame that's a little more subtle, and this has changed in the past few years too, is 90 days is what I want to talk about. And that's the other time period. So this is when you're at the greatest risk of stroke after you've had a TIA, okay? So, you know, these patients, uh, they will need an urgent workup. Uh, you know, they need to be evaluated. They need medical treatment for this TIA. And in some cases, they would need uh, an urgent, if not emergent, procedural intervention to prevent the stroke. So I'm sure you've seen this scenario and we get it all the time. Someone was weak in their arm, you know, granddad went weak in his arm, was like that for half an hour, you know, got better, just ignored it and stayed home. You know, maybe his kids, his wife, someone was saying, you need to go to the hospital and get checked out. No, I'm fine now. I don't need it. You know, maybe someone couldn't talk uh, for 15, 20 minutes but they got better. Um, they knew something was wrong, but you know, they don't want to go through all the hassle of going to an emergency department and waiting. Um, they don't want to bother 911, calling all of those things. Well, this is an important opportunity for us because these are patients who have not yet had a stroke and are at an extremely high risk. And it's pretty obvious from all of our studies and our, our guidelines that if you really aggressively try to help this patient population, you can prevent a lot of strokes. So 90 days is the time where you're at the highest risk um, after a TIA. And really, we, even recently, we found, you know, 48 hours is where you're at the highest risk after a TIA. Um, you know, and then 21 days is another big 
time frame as well, but up to 90 days. So this is a really good slide to show you how important it is um, to look at you know, the number of patients after TIAs who will have strokes. So within 48 hours, um, and this is our patients who do come to the emergency department, the ones who will have a stroke within 48 hours is 5%. So all these TIAs you, come, you bring in, you know, one out of 20 of those is going to have a stroke. And then the number who will have it within 90 days is 10%. Uh, so ex extremely high. Um, and, and that's high because, you know, as you probably know, a lot of the things that get classified as, as TIAs are probably not vascular events. Some of these are just, just not vascular events. So, and that's even including those really in this number. So some of these, you know, migraines with aura, things like that, that get classified as TIAs and put in this category, even keeping them in the category, 10% will have a stroke in 90 days. This is a huge, huge area of opportunity to prevent strokes. <laughs> And so a recurrent TIA will also occur in 12.7%. They're also at a higher risk of cardiovascular events and the 2.6% risk of death, likely from a cardiovascular event or, risk, uh, event or a stroke. So <clears throat> an urgent workup of these patients is absolutely crucial. Now, uh, and let me just talk about, so the question is, well, what will you do over this time period, period if we bring them with the TIA? And the patients will ask us this. You're at their house. Maybe they called 911, they were hemiplegic, aphasic, something, they got better. And you go, you need to come to the emergency department. But will they do anything differently? This is the question you'll get. Will they really do anything differently? I'll tell you what we'll do, okay? They'll come in and, uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll get a call, we'll see them. Um, if they're in an outline facility, they'll call us as well. Certainly anybody in our system or at CMH, they'll call us and hopefully, and all the other facilities in the region should have someone they can get a hold of. So they'll call. And we'll say, look, we need to figure out exactly why they've had a TIA. We'll get an ultrasound of their heart. We'll get some type of vessel imaging, ultrasound of the carotids or a CT angiogram. You know, we'll get a couple of labs that are important. Uh, and then, you know, obviously we'll get brain imaging. And so uh, a certain percentage of these patients who come in and the symptoms have resolved will actually have a stroke on imaging. Uh, a number of these patients, especially the ones who have the recurrent TIAs, may have a carotid artery that's 95% stenosed. Uh, they, they may have a basilar artery stenosis, vertebral artery stenosis bilaterally, things that need to be dealt with uh, within a, a couple days. And so there's a, a pretty high proportion of them who will have that. Let's say they don't. Let's say it's not that they need a procedure. You know, some of them may have a left ventricular thrombus. We see that in ultrasound, which, you know, you probably get into where some of these cardiovascular events come from or they may need anticoagulated right there. And this is causing embolization that's causing TIAs, very small strokes um, that we can't see on imaging potentially, but are causing these deficits. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Then also within the past um, three years, two really big trials have come out, one called the POINT trial, one called the CHANCE trial. And I won't, won't bore you too much with all the details of those, but essentially, in those trials, they took patients who'd had a TIA, a high-risk TIA, and we have a way of, of risk stratifying them called an ABC2 score, if you want to look that up. But we use that to risk stratify them. And if they're a moderate to high-risk TIA, we'll put them on dual antiplatelet therapy for 21 days. And, uh, and we'll see them back in clinic soon uh, to make sure that one gets stopped and then we've addressed everything. And so both of those trials showed a, a a substantial improvement in preventing strokes if you just medically treat those TIAs aggressively on the sh on the short term, um, which is, you know, without getting into the details, you know, I've, the protocol we've come up with here is that we treat them for 21 days with dual antiplatelet therapy. So, someone who has a TIA, the answer is yes. Uh, when you see them in their home and they say, "I'm better now. I don't want to go," say, "Look, you're at a really high risk of stroke over the next 48 hours for sure." Certain over the next 90 days, even, you know, 10%, you know, risk of stroke. Uh, so you come in, we can prevent a stroke, which is way better even than treating it acutely. So that 90 days is really important for us. That 48 hours after TIA is really important. And we try to make this as easy for people as possible. Uh, we've developed an outpatient TIA protocol um, that we use here at Cox, where, you know, people don't want to stay in the hospital if they're normal. So we have an expedited way of the, the next day 
getting all of the other imaging they need and an echocardiogram, carotid ultrasounds. And I have my staff that can see them in clinic the very next day in case they just, they really don't want to stay. It's also cheaper for them, more convenient. So we really, you know, because this is a priority for me, because it really makes a difference, we're trying to develop ways to make this as easy for people and to really help them because it's, it's much better to prevent a stroke, obviously, than even treating it acutely. So the short of it is if someone says I, I'm back to normal, it was a TIA, still try to, you know, do your best to, to try to get them to come in so we can take a look at them and try to help them out. Uh, and we're always happy to try to see these patients in clinic as soon as we can. And I'm sure, you know, everybody feels the same way about it. So this slide is an important one to remember too. You know, if you have a TIA, really at a higher risk of stroke. So we've got, you know, challenges specific to our area. And, you know, like I said, I'm from the Ozarks. I'm very, you know, we're very committed to, to putting things in place that are appropriate for our region. Um, so we do have an elevated incidence of stroke in our area compared to the, the country as a whole. We also have a population density that leads us to try to find good ways to leverage our resources across a, a, a large area. You know, and you have to have systems that work for your specific area. So in Houston, for example, they give TPA on the ambulance. They have a mobile CT scanner. Uh, they go, they pick up a patient, they pull to the side of the road, they do a CT scan, and there's a neurologist there and they give them TPA. Makes a lot of sense for Houston where four and a half hours is how long it may take you to get across the city um, in, in the traffic and everything. Doesn't make a lot of sense for us here. So we've got we've to try to do the same thing except in other ways. Try to, try to make things work for the system we have here and for our patients. So the population density is, is obviously a challenge. We have entire counties with one hospital. Well, I'll tell you what, that hospital needs to be a primary stroke center if at all possible. Um, and that's what we're trying to help people do. Um, and we need to give, give them support as opposed to saying, we'll just do a good job at Mercy and Cox with strokes. We need to try to help everybody do a really good job. Um, you know, and, uh, and you know, Mercy can do thrombectomies. Cox is the compre only comprehensive stroke center between Fayetteville and Columbia. So that's a huge, a huge area to cover, right? Uh, so if you want a thrombectomy, you have to go either to Mercy or Cox. So there's two hospitals in Southwest Missouri that can do this and one of them all the time. So uh, we have a huge catchment area. We get often patients from uh, Harrison, from also from uh, even Oklahoma, we've brought them in for acute care. So we also have um, what I would say is those are its tragic flaw. If you know what a tragic flaw is, it's something that's a really good quality, but can also lead to, lead to problems. People from those are very self-reliant. They're very independent. Uh, they, they don't want to ask anything of people. And these are great qualities, but it also means we have to work and take care of these people uh, who, who kind of approach things that way, you know, and, you know, they're going to, they don't want to leave. They've got to take care of their grandkids. They've got to take care of their neighbor's dogs. You know, these are the things that people in those arcs do, which is one, one reason why, you know, I care so much about them, but they got to take care of themselves in these settings too. So this is a challenge we face too, is to try to educate uh, people on that. So in terms of the first, the first challenge I mentioned there, to go in a little deeper, um, there's this thing called the stroke belt. Um, and so there's an area uh, with the highest rate of, um, of death due to stroke in the U.S. And you can see the darker colors here on this slide are that area. Um, now this is from 2013 to 15, which is the most comprehensive date on that time, but uh, it, it still holds true, you know. Uh, it's, really, it's really not entirely known. You can break this down by demographics you can break this down but by other things but it still cuts across you know uh racial disparities too like you know for whatever reason something about this region um and it even cuts across obesity and o overweight statistics so for whatever reason this is a, a an area where there are more strokes per capita and the outcome outcomes are worse and it you can see where that is there and we are included in this you know um certainly uh, and so we have to really be, be on top of things here, so high rate. Then here's a map where, of a population density, right, to show you the challenges we face that are just very different than some other places. Um, so obviously the lighter areas here are the, the least uh, population dense. So you guys have to travel a lot further. We have to go further out to get to and from places. We have to try to utilize the resources uh, to make this happen. So we have to also judiciously use resources like helicopter rides, uh, you know, because the burden on the system is tremendous. But I also think about 
we really have to save someone's family who has to pay their share even after insurance of, of an unnecessary uh, air care flight. Um, and so we want to try to mitigate that. They may, that may be th their life savings. That may be a huge stress that puts on them. So we're trying to do things to help with this. Uh, one of those is to try to have CT angiogram and CT perfusion in outline hospitals so we can evaluate patients for thrombectomy before they come to comprehensive stroke centers. And so we would know before they leave. This is important for two reasons. It's important for one, because then they can come straight to IR. Door to needle time is 60 minutes. A lot better if we get the imaging there and can send them straight to interventional radiology. Okay. The other thing is this would save an unnecessary, um, you know, helicopter ride. Essentially, these all would be air care, weather permitting. So that's a tremendous uh, help. So if I can look at the imaging or the other neurologist can look at the imaging when they're at an outline facility and determine whether they need to come, that, that helps a lot. And so this is something we're trying to do to try to keep people in their, in their communities that don't need to be transferred uh, to minimize disruption in their lives, uh, to minimize the cost to them, and then to be good stewards of the resources we have as healthcare systems in this region. So there are a lot of challenges that come with population density you guys probably appreciate even better than I do. Um, and so we're trying to address those. So anything we do is stroke um, has to address, you know, our specific challenges to our region. And, and this is one of them. So I'm going to give you two cases of that, <laughs> that present some of these specific challenges and, and how, how they would, would play out. So this is case one. Uh, so this was a, uh, a 68 year old Vietnam veteran who lived on a farm in the rural Ozarks, uh, fit with the risk factor profile a lot of our patients have, you know, um, heart failure, coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. You know, you, you know this, is, this is kind of what goes along with a lot of our stroke patients. Um, and, you know, acute onset, slurred speech, left hemi body weakness, out feeding the cattle, tries to call uh, his wife, having trouble understanding him, you know, doesn't, you know, you know, hard to get what time that was, you know, finally, you know, get him in tries to shake it off, rub some dirt on it, what, you know, whatever you do uh, to get this to, to go away, um, it doesn't go away. All right. And so this is someone who's, in this case, was three and a half miles down a dirt road, three miles outside of a town that was only 1,700 people, you know, with one stoplight. So there's a challenge here. All right. So, like I said, patient ignores the symptoms. And this, this is what, what we face. Only one third of patients with a stroke ever call 911 or their family ever calls 911. And this is where us just uh, educating the community is, is very important. Tries to get these done. Then instead of calling 911, drives to the VA clinic 45 minutes away. All right. And this points us to another challenge we have to address. And every time I see a stroke patient in clinic, the last thing I leave them with is, what are you going to do if you have a stroke again or something that seems like a stroke? What are you going to do? You're going to call 911. And we have to continually reinforce that because all the studies show, and we all see this, if someone arrives via EMS, they're way more like, likely to get timely intervention. Someone walks to the front door of an ED somewhere, someone drove them, we don't know they're coming. Um, that triage process is really, is really good. It's really effective in the EDs and they do a great job with it, but it's, it just doesn't happen the same as if you guys get them, we know they're coming, they come in the back door, cock south, they roll over a, a scale and they roll right around the, the corner to the scan. And so if we know they're coming, so this is a challenge, uh, you know, most patients don't call. And then if they come, they may come in a way that's, that's not optimal. Um, so, so this patient was then sent to uh, the, uh, a stroke center uh, from there, a comprehensive stroke center. Last no normal was seven hours um, after. So by the time they got there, we're out of the window for any therapy. Um, a patient was discharged to rehab and then still, you know, there's... <laughs> you know, had two more strokes, kind of was handled, handled similarly, and is now in a hospice. So this patient never got TPA or thrombectomy, still never seen a neurologist. It just, this case uh, shows us the challenges that even a relatively capable person, uh, you know, will have in, in our region, uh, you know, and we've got to try to do our best to, to help with that. Now, case two. Okay, 74-year-old woman, and, and I, really, I love this case because of the outcome. And it just shows, shows what can be done. A 74-year-old woman with a past medical history significant for hypertension was found unresponsive by her husband. Her GCS was four, okay? Not a lot going on there. And uh, 
let me show you. Uh, I've got two scans here. Now, you, you know, you're not used to probably looking at Catherine geography. So I will uh, just show you the one that should be on your left is, is a scan. You can see two arteries going up. Those are the vertebral arteries, the two on the sides. And then they join together to form the basilar artery. So, you know, the carotids go up in the front, the vertebral arteries go up in the back, and then they form the basal artery that then supplies the brain stem. Then as the basal artery goes up, it splits into two uh, posterior cerebral arteries. And these supply your visual cortex and also the thalamus. So they, they supply the thalami bilaterally. So very, very important. Okay, so the left one, you can see vertebral arteries. See there, two of them go up, and you can see where they, they join and form the basal artery and there's nothing. There's nothing there. This is an acute basilar artery thrombus, right? So there's no blood supply from the, from the posterior circulation, from the back, to the thalamus, all right? So the, these two, the, the two thalami, that's what makes you conscious. Um, uh, and so if you have a stroke to both of those, you're locked in at best and probably would have a devastating brainstem stroke probably would have stayed with the GCS of four. Okay, you see the second one on the right. This patient got here, uh, actually got to, you know, came in the ED uh, at I, I, Branson, I believe. And so a good job of that ED physician to realize this could have been a stroke, right? A good job by the husband of, was there, figured it out, you know, got him there quickly, called 911, brought them in, they rolled in, okay? got advanced imaging there and realized we realized what was going on you see the picture on the right okay you see the picture on the right so this is uh what it should look like look at the top of that so there's the vertebral artery that comes in from the right you don't see the left one now because things are flowing forward just that's just one of the ways this imaging works things are flowing actually flowing the way they should so that goes up and you see both of the posterior uh, cerebral arteries there so this is a patient um, who went a thrombectomy. She left without mild deficits. She didn't even need physical therapy, occupational therapy, didn't need speech therapy. She went home with an NIH stroke scale of zero after having a GCS of four. It, it, would, have, it would have been over. Okay. Um, and so, look, those two cases present, uh, you know, help show the difference and and how things can go if, if we have everything that works really well from start to finish, which you guys are part of. And to me, you guys are part of that, not only getting there, figuring this out quickly and letting us know, but you, know, that you, you guys are all embedded in these communities, spread out all over the region. And part of it is for us to, to let our, our neighbors and our family know, you know what a stroke looks like, to let them know what can be done, you know, because TPA has only been, hasn't, I mean, it sounds like a long time, but we're, we're talking about not even 30 years. Thrombectomy is being standard of care. We're talking about within five years. So a lot of people don't realize that things can be done and dramatic things like this. You know, this patient didn't get TPA, but she, you know, she's totally fine now because of this. So we got to be out there telling them, um, look, if you have a stroke or you even have a T TIA, we got to get you in here. We got to get it figured out. There's things that can be done um, and, and we will do. So um, those two are really important cases to demonstrate the difference. Um, and so here's a patient who, not on hospice, but is totally fine, probably not even really aware of how bad things could have been. Um, and then that's good, that's what we want. Um, that first case was my dad, actually. And so, you know, we've got, all of us probably know somebody here who, stroke is the second leading cause of morbidity in the world. We're gonna, we're gonna all know somebody who's affected by this. And we've gotta really be careful to let them know things can be done and take care of it very quickly start to finish. So all of us, if we haven't been affected by this, will be at some point. And we have the resources in the region to do it. We just need to all get together and leverage those to, to help people and knowing those challenges we have. So this is a, a third case. And uh, I just this is a, a case, I, I think I saw this as a, as a resident. Um, and just to show you that strokes, you know, can be can be subtle. There can be some things. So uh, this is a 50 year old truck driver, past medical history of high blood pressure and tobacco use, um, and being a truck driver, which is independently a pretty big risk factor for stroke, uh, came in with a chief complaint of seeing demons for two days. 
um, this came on suddenly. He's driving his truck, and uh, these are these are demons. They're like the little pitchfork, pitchfork and tail horn. Those kind of demons saw him, knew they weren't real. He's not doesn't have psychosis. Uh, knew they weren't real, and uh, was having trouble driving because they were, they were distracting. So he came into the emergency department, and you know what's going on? Is he is he drunk? Is it is he psychotic? Um, does he have some kind of poisoning? Uh, is it some kind of brain infection or is it a stroke? Um, and then what we realized was he had a, what we call a left homonymous hemianopsia, meaning he couldn't see, he didn't have vision in the left half of his vision in both eyes, which is something that always comes from the brain. That comes from a stroke in the posterior cerebral artery. So here's just, uh, not, to, not to bore you with too much of the, the later neurology stuff, but, but here's an MRI and stroke neurology is pretty, pretty easy as far as, as things go. You know, we've got a bright spot and a dark spot, and that's how we tell there's a stroke. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's not too hard, which is why I like it. It's pretty clear cut. So look, we have what we would expect, uh, a bright spot on our, ADC, on our diffusion weighted imaging and a dark spot on our ADC. So he has a stroke where we'd expect, right? Right, PCA territory. And then this is a susceptibility weighted imaging. It shows a, uh, a dilated basilar artery there. Um, and then there's an, you can see there's an aneurysm there that he had that was causing strokes to come from this aneurysm with a blood clot, caused a stroke there, and then caused him to have uh, hallucinations. So this was what we call Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, so, you know, you can get vision loss acutely, and then you get hallucination. Um, it can occur with those strokes. And once again, here's a patient who had this aneurysm successfully coiled and treated and we're able, this guy was able to be helped from a pretty, pretty serious issue there. So <clears throat> there's a whole spectrum of, of things that can be done um, in these cases if we all get together on the same page. And we can take another uh, break or how long do you guys think? Or do you want to stop there? A break. Okay. Hi. So um, we have a little more time, and so I'll move now from going over, you know, specifics of setting up, you know, how to take care of strokes in this region and specificities there to just an overview of, of stroke um, pathophysiology and, and just a little understanding there. So some people say, you know, stroke is a brain attack, meaning, you know, think of it like a heart attack. All right, so, you know, as a rule, what happens is, you know, there, there are a few ways you can get a stroke, but when you think about the vessel often will get atherosclerotic plaque that will build up, and then that will then lead to thrombus formation there and a lack of blood flow, or it could also lead to thrombus that then embolizes, uh, you know, meaning it sends off a smaller blood clot or the blood clot itself goes somewhere else from where it formed. Um, and so, that's usually the mechanism. So um, it's an, obviously it's an emergency, it's preventable, but just some basics on the epidemiology, <clears throat> you know, 800,000 people a year in the U.S., 200,000 deaths, uh, fifth leading cause of death, but the leading cause of long-term disability, which I think is what scares most people when you talk about stroke is they don't necessarily think of, of death, they think of, uh, you know, being in a nursing home for the rest of their life, and that is a very, <clears throat> very common outcome. So prevention and then acute treatment are really the goal because once you've had a stroke, you know, we're kind of limited to what therapies can do to help you get better. So I've already showed you the stroke belt in the other portion part, but I'll talk about two main types of stroke. And, and this may be some basic information, but it's, but it's important. And, and a lot of the community, uh, you know, may need to be educated on the difference between these two. So there's ischemic strokes, which are a lack of blood flow um, and usually from an artery being blocked. That accounts for the vast majority of strokes, 80 to 85 percent. Then there's also strokes that come from the rupture of a blood vessel. Um, and uh, those are about 15, thankfully only 15 to 20 percent of strokes because they have a much worse outcome. And uh, so here's a picture of an acute, you know, infarct like I showed you seen earlier on the slide. This is a diffusion weighted imaging. Um, and so you have the bright spot there as an acute stroke. Uh, here's a, a pathology slide showing you know, necrosis after that as well. So this is kind of what the brain would look like on gross specimen. Then this is a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, and this is a CT scan 
And so you see the bright spot, we call that hyperdense. Um, but this is, you know, typically what a, a stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke looks like from high blood pressure, right? And, you know, this is another reason, you know, controlling blood pressure is the number one thing we can do to prevent a second stroke or to prevent um, an intracerebral hemorrhage. And so these have much worse outcomes than ischemic strokes. And here's what this looks like on a path specimen, uh, pretty, pretty devastating. So, um, you know, when we think about a stroke a differential, when someone comes in and a stroke, so is a sudden acute neurological deficit. I think it's helpful to know where the word stroke came from. You know, obviously I'm, I'm a language guy, but you know, this came from long ago, obviously before CTs, MRIs or anything, uh, where it came on suddenly as if you were stricken or struck from the heavens, right? So think about being struck by lightning. It comes on that suddenly. That's, that's how a stroke occurs. Sudden. I was fine, then I couldn't use my arm. I was fine, then I couldn't feel my, my arm. I was fine, then I couldn't talk. So a stroke is if you're, you're struck from the heavens. comes on suddenly. Um, and so that's what makes you think it has a vascular cause. Um, now things that kind of come on more gradually, uh, you think it might, uh, what we call a migraine with aura potentially. My hand was numb, then it moved up my arm, then it included my face, and then I got a headache. That sounds more, more like a migraine. We always take that seriously and have to be very careful. Um, but there are other things that can present and look like a stroke. Like I said, a migraine with Nora. Uh, you could have a low glucose, uh, certainly, and that's why we always check for glucose before we give TPA. Or you could have a seizure. Someone could have a seizure and then have what's called a Todd's phenomenon, which is, uh, you know, it seems like a stroke because the area that seized then isn't working. And so maybe they're not able to move one side of their body because this is after a seizure. So that, those are the things that can look like strokes um, that are in the differential. And you, when you guys see them, it may look exactly like a stroke. And you really can't, can't often tell a difference. So then we talked a little bit about a TIA, but from a technical standpoint, you know, it's, it's kind of like thinking about angina for, for heart disease. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that's telling us we really need to figure out what's going on and treat it urgently. So these deficits have to have resolved in less than 24 hours, but the vast majority of them never last more than 20 minutes. Um, and like I said, I went over those slides earlier. It's an important warning about a stroke. So we really need to get to see them quickly. Um, these are, I talked about this, the point and chance trials. <clears throat> you know, we, we try to give patients uh, maximal medical therapy 21 days after their, uh, their TIA to prevent, to prevent a stroke. So what are just some basic stroke symptoms? Weakness, numbness, especially on one side of the body, especially. You know, as you know, the brain, one side, you know, of the brain, say the left side goes to the right side of the body. So anytime it's just on one side, that's, that's even more the chance it's going to be stroke than something else. Uh, difficulty speaking or understanding speech. This is the hard one. Someone's old, has dementia potentially, um, or they're, they're not, you know, they don't communicate that well in general. Really hard sometimes to tell the difference between a speech problem and, and some of those other things, or infection, are they just encephalopathic? So we always want to make sure we've ruled out stroke. Also, we're very aggressive with aphasia, loss of speech, because it's a very devastating uh, injury and causes a lot of disability. So that's, that's one we want to check very carefully for. Vision loss in one or both eyes, okay? A severe headache that's unusual for that patient. You know, some people will call this a thunderclap headache, worst headache of their life. They've never had a headache like this. That often can be a sign of a hemorrhagic stroke. Now dizziness, <clears throat> and let me just say, the word dizziness, you know, depending on where you're at, it, it, what people mean by that varies regionally. There are three things people can mean uh, when they say dizzy, and I, I've, I've tried to just ask, learn to kind of ask specifically about these. So dizziness can mean feeling, for some people, means they feel lightheaded, as if they're going to faint. Because it's one thing people can mean. That's usually not, usually not a stroke. But there are two other things that could be a stroke. When people say dizziness, the other things they could mean are they could mean vertigo. Some people, when they say they're dizzy, they mean vertigo, the sensation that the room is spinning, like they've just gotten off of a, a carnival ride, something like that. That, if it has another symptom associated with it or is acute and onset and doesn't go away, that could be the sign of a very dangerous stroke. Okay. Then the other could be, when they say they're dizzy, they may also mean they can't get their balance. And that could also be the sign of a stroke. They could have what we call proprioceptive loss. You know, they could have a stroke 
that caused sensory deficits and now they can't get their balance or a cerebellar stroke. So dizziness and vertigo could be signs of very dangerous, subtle stroke. Um, so if they mean those two things by dizziness, then that certainly could be. Um, and especially if they say, I'm kind of numb, I'm really dizzy, I have a facial droop, and I'm really dizzy, and they mean vertigo. Well, that's something that's, uh, that could be a very bad stroke. So those are the symptoms, all right? But So obviously location in the brain determines what symptoms you have. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, you've got a little you know, picture up here, a little graphic. So the frontal lobe, really hard to tell that someone's had a stroke. They can have a very big stroke in the frontal lobe, and we don't notice a whole lot. It's pretty subtle, especially acutely. But now, if someone has trouble understanding language, then that's what we call from Wernicke's area. And that's in the, the, the parietal lobe there. And that's going to be someone who has, you know, they're able to, they can't follow commands, right? Uh, they may be able to, to verbalize, to say some nonsense, but they cannot follow commands. And then um, we have Wernicke's area, which is another area where people just, they can't, um, they can't understand <clears throat> language there. And so um, then Broca's area is where you express language. So they may be able to understand you, but they don't say anything. Maybe they just seem quiet. Maybe you think they're just stressed out. You know, maybe you, you think they're really anxious and they're not saying anything. That can certainly be that can certainly be a stroke. And in terms of isolated aphasias, the way the blood vessels break down is the middle cerebral artery comes in from the carotid and then it divides in two. And part of it goes superior and part of it goes inferior. And so the superior part usually, if you get a stroke there, usually will affect the arm too. But you can certainly get a stroke where people can uh, can understand you but can't say a whole lot, and it it be um, just broke his area and, and it just be aphasia and it could even be close enough there to be amenable to a thrombectomy so that's the one you know we worry about sometimes and and even though you know they, they're not weak if they have trouble with language especially expressing language they might still have a really big debilitating stroke um, and so the occipital lobe like we said is vision and uh, and then the, the temporal lobe it's harder to, to see a, um, a whole lot more from that so um, obviously you know the stroke will, as a rule, without getting into some of the more complicated brainstem syndromes, is going to be on the, the opposite side. So then we think about whether there are cortical signs, and uh, that's, that's important for us. Um, and then we think about whether there's uh, a distribution that makes sense with where the blood vessels are. And this can help us tease out between things like conversion disorder or a stroke or, or maybe, it's, maybe it's a spinal cord issue. So that, that helps us some. So obviously the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. The right side controls the left side. Um, now, these cross somewhere in the brainstem. You know, that we have what we call the decussation of the pyramids. And, and so it goes opposite. And mo most of you know that. And this is just a picture to show you where these, uh, these cross over. And so, you know, if it's spinal cord, it's going to be same side. If it's a brain, it's going to be opposite side. And then, so this is actually pretty important. So how do you tell a cortical from a subcortical stroke? And so what, just to explain what we mean by the cortex is the outside of the brain on the top, you know, the, the gray matter. The, the subcortex is the deeper parts. Okay, so what are cortical signs and why are they important? So patients who get thrombectomies will typically, to, to be eligible for a thrombectomy, they almost always will have um, cortical signs because it's going to be one of those large arteries. The subcortical strokes usually come from the small artery, small vessel disease, and usually are not eligible for thrombectomies. Um, so what's a cortical sign? Well, aphasias, like we just talked about. So the inability to understand or speak would be a, a cortical sign, and that's almost always localized to the left side of the brain, the left cortex. A gaze preference, meaning they're, they're tending to look to one side. Right? Sometimes they can still look back the other way some, sometimes they can't. They're tending to want to always look over here. Um, neglect, meaning they're not really moving their left side, say. You know, that's, that's one sign. They don't really notice things over here. Maybe you even put an IV in and they don't even move. Um, or maybe they, they move when you pinch them, but they don't on their own move that side. So neglect is certainly a cortical sign. Personality changes, that's a very subtle one. We don't see too often and, and hard to tell when you first meet somebody. Um, 
So then some of these others are a little more subtle and, and probably not as helpful for you. You know, you, you're not going to be testing for graphesthesia. And to be honest, I'm not in the emergency department either. But those are your cortical signs. And then subcortical strokes will tend to have uh, the whole body on the opposite side be weak or lose sensation. Uh, and so that's what you get. So the other thing too is if it's a cortical stroke, like let's say a left MCA or a right MCA, um, then those will tend to have the arm weaker than the leg, unless it involves the subcortical structures. A subcortical stroke, if someone's weak, will tend to be face, arm, and leg the same. And so that's another thing that can help you. So if face, arm, and leg are all weak, that's probably subcortical. But hey, if it's they can't talk and their arm's weak and the leg's still okay, hey, that's, that's, that's definitely a cortical stroke. So we call these deep strokes that are subcortical. You'll hear some people say lacunar infarcts. Um, and these are 25% of smoke of strokes, um, small, deep, and these are, are deep in the little blood vessels, and so usually not a, a candidate for thrombectomy there, but certainly these do respond well to TPA. Um, and so these are things that come from having hypertension, diabetes, longstanding, tobacco uh, abuse, high cholesterol, all of those risk factors that so many of our patients have. And these are, um, are the ones that are there. So like I said, these can be where you just have motor deficits. You're just weak in the face, arm, and leg on the other side, usually equally. Okay, and these are in the, you may hear say, internal capsule, the, the pons, the coronal radiata. So these are all the, the lacunar syndromes. Um, you may have someone who's got weak and clumsy on that side. Um, and then, you know, that can sometimes be the legs greater than the arm, but, but often the same. And then uh, dysarthria, clumsy hand, is one we see frequently. Uh, and this is one people may try to kind of pass off and not come in. They just, they couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't text, they couldn't type, um, and then their speech is slurred. So that is also a subcortical stroke and can be subtle, but, but it is pretty debilitating. You know, if they're right-handed and it's their right hand, uh, and they're, especially if someone's very high functioning, this is a pretty debilitating stroke. Um, and the dysarthria is extremely frustrating to people um, and can cause a lot of issues too. So those are the, the short ones, the subcortical ones in short. Uh, the other thing is you can get just sensory deficits, fa face, arm, and leg, okay? And then you can get both sensory and motor. And then this is just a look at where the blood vessels go. Um, it's color-coded here. The green's the middle cerebral artery. Um, the kind of uh, peachish color there is the anterior cerebral artery. And then you can kind of see the posterior cerebral artery um, there. And the anterior cerebral artery, you know, that's a very unusual to get a stroke there. But what you would get is you'd get leg weaker than arm usually on the opposite side. Um, and then the middle cerebral artery would usually be arm weaker than leg. And then those cortical signs we talked about, either neglect if it's on the right or aphasia if it's on the left. And the posterior cerebral artery would lead to the visual issues we talked about. Usually loss of vision in one half of the vision of both eyes. Okay, and sometimes you can get some language issues there as well. So um, just to go over the, the MCA syndromes, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but on the left, difficulty with language, gaze deviation to the left, you know, um, a field cut on the right, um, and then weakness arm greater than leg, and then loss of sensation on the left. And then from the right hemisphere, as a rule, you won't get language uh, changes. Um, you can get gaze deviation, and you may get their inability to notice things on that side. Um, you know, if you put your hands up um, and you can put two fingers up, like two sets of fingers up and say, you know, like this, and they'll only see the ones over here when you show them two. But if you just showed them one on the bad side, they still be able to count it sometimes. Um, and then you could get a field de deficit. And then once again, weak arm greater than leg and loss of sensation. Like I said, ACA, very uncommon. Um, leg is weaker than the arm. You may get a gaze preference from sensory loss. You know, and this is just a picture, you know, you, you probably see in school a, a lot briefly, but essentially the leg is, this is called the homunculus, but the leg is on top of the brain. And then as you go down, you get the face and then the, uh, the hand. And, um, you know, it's important that the face and the hand are close to each other. So right MCA is usually, you know, face and hand. And often when people get seizures in that area, they'll feel numb in their hand and their face, you know. So just you know, knowing that those are kind of there in that middle cerebral artery territory. And then a PCA syndrome would be um, a loss of vision on, on one side. Um, or if it was both of them totally blind, 
which is unusual but happens in some some bad strokes like the one I showed you earlier with the basilar artery that was occluded. That patient had bilateral cortical blindness, couldn't see anything. Um, but that's unusual in a very bad stroke, obviously. Um, and then these are some, you know, I won't go into too much, these other more uh, obscure, you know, issues that can come up there. Um, and then, you know, the brainstem and cerebellar strokes, these are more challenging to localize. They're more challenging to realize it's a stroke. But it's, it's important to at least be aware of these because the patients may not have as obvious of symptoms, but the strokes are potentially more debilitating. And certainly of all the ischemic strokes, the blood clot strokes, these are the ones that lead to, uh, lead to mortality. So, um, you know, you could get, and very unusual, but like the case earlier with the brainstem stroke, quadriparesis, can't move at all, can't feel at all in any of the extremities. That can happen in a very bad uh, brainstem stroke. Someone with a GCS of four, for example, could be, could be. If we don't have another reason, we at least need to think about stroke and get CT angiogram. Um, now, if you have findings on one side of the face in the opposite side of the body, that could be the sign because we talked about where those tracks cross. So face is, is numb over here and then body's numb over here. Okay, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that could be a brainstem stroke. Okay, so, you know, loss of consciousness, decreased consciousness. Like we said, vertigo, uh, refractory nausea, vomiting. Um, if you have eye movement abnormalities that aren't like a gaze preference, but let's say one of the eyes is off, you know, you, you, it's a third nerve issue where it's down and out. Or when you try to go this way, this one can't. It's called internuclear ophthalmoplegia. It's not that, that's, a, that's actually a pretty common thing, you know, but... Um, that, that's a sign of a brainstem stroke or the eyes are just going, you know, these are all things to think about a brainstem stroke and, uh, you know, really bad dysarthria and nothing else. It's probably a medullary stroke, a brainstem stroke. Um, and so all of those things are, are, to, should clue you into, man, this may be a subtle stroke. It's not obvious. They may not even be weak at all, but, um, that's one we really wouldn't need to get to. And, uh, you can get, so cerebellar infarcts. And I'll tell you why these are really important in a second. So you can get ataxia, loss of coordination um, of the opposite side of the body. So someone who just got, like I said, just really, they say dizzy. They say, hey, I'm dizzy. But what they mean is I can't get my balance. You know, I'm falling and I can't even sit up. And, and you see this sometimes. So cerebellar strokes are really important because someone, they may have a stroke scale of one or zero right? Because ataxia is just one on the stroke scale. They may have a stroke scale of one, but if they don't get a suboccipital craniectomy, meaning a, a neurosurgeon goes and takes the, this back bottom part of the skull off, because there's not much room in the back of the brain to swell, uh, the posterior fossa we call it, you know, your brain's got two cavities. You've got, you've got the big one on top and the, the smaller one on bottom. If you have a cerebellar stroke, it can be really big and you don't know it because the symptoms aren't that bad. And then if that patient within three days doesn't get a craniectomy and, and treatment for that, that's a fatal stroke. And so these are the ones that scare us as neurologists. If someone comes in with dizziness, they say, oh, they're dizzy. Ooh, you want to, I just, it makes me a little nervous because I want to say, okay, let me make sure this is not some subtle presentation of a potentially fatal stroke. And so the dizziness in that case, once again, is not, I feel like I'm going to pass out. It's either vertigo or it's a loss of balance. And if they have loss of balance, and maybe one of the eyes is, is not wanting to go where it should or they're disconjugate, that's a bad stroke. And that's one that would need to be taken care of. And in terms of the swelling for cerebellar strokes, it usually reaches its peak, any kind of swelling from a stroke, at day three to day five. You know, some people say day two to day five, depending on the literature you look at. So this patient will be like, well, I'm kind of fine. I'm just have bad, bad balance over here, can't grab stuff. So they're okay for a couple days. Then all of a sudden, someone comes in, they're unresponsive and, and they've herniated. That happens not infrequently. So we all have to be on our guard for those. And it's easy for, for, for all of us to miss those. Uh, but if they get treatment, if they get the appropriate treatment, these patients do extremely well. So it's one of those situations where it's really, really important to catch it because their outcomes can be really good if we get to them and it's really subtle. And the outcomes are really bad if they don't get to um, you know, a place that has uh, you know, you know, neurosurgical help as well. So, what are the causes of stroke? Um, so, large vessel atherosclerosis, meaning 
the, the plaque builds up in the large vessels, the carotid arteries, the middle cerebral arteries, the posterior cerebral arteries. That's 45%. Um, and then uh, small vessel disease, meaning the deep vessels in the brains, those lacunar vessels we talked about, it's about 20%. And then uh, cardiogenic embolism, usually from atrial fibrillation, uh, is about 20% as well. And then that's only 85%, uh, you may be doing the math. So that means 15% are what we call cryptogenic, meaning we don't know where they came from. We don't necessarily figure them out. And so, or they're part of these other categories. So very rare things, which if it's one of these other things, they, they probably should come see me in, in stroke clinics. So, um, you know, hypercoagulable states, you know, that they have genetically or some other kinds of issues, vasculitis or moya moya, all these other less common things that we deal with. But, but by and large, these are the causes. Um, and then the major causes of bleeding strokes, once again, going back to bleeding strokes, um, usually high blood pressure, usually. Sometimes you get a subarachnoid hemorrhage um, that's usually due to a ruptured aneurysm, but can also be due to some other things uh, that are less common. Uh, reversible cerebrovasoconstriction syndrome is another one that often comes from, from drug use, but both of those present with really, really bad headaches, both an aneurysm rupture and uh, what we call RCVS, uh, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So anytime someone has one of those what we call thunderclap headaches, it's, it's often one of those two things. And the outcomes for obviously aneurysm rupture or intracerebral hemorrhage are, are, very, are very poor in general. So we really, if there's a patient that we can get to and, and try to help with those, we want to do the best we can. Um, so what are the things we can do to help uh, prevent strokes? Well, there's some things you, you can't change, or, you, know, uh, you know, but some things are modifiable. Uh, hypertension would be one of the most important things here. Um, we can certainly try to decrease that. And there's a really good, just to show you how important this is, a really good trial that was published three years ago called the SPRINT trial. Um, and it was the best blood pressure trial really that's ever been done. And it showed that we want to not only get people below 140, but as close to 120 as possible once they've had a stroke for secondary prevention. And it was, the trial was stopped halfway through because it was so obvious that that was helpful. So the blood pressure is one that, you know, it, it's not a complicated thing. Nobody gets to feel like they're real clever for helping somebody's blood pressure, but it's an absolutely vital thing. And it's something that's easy for people to, to neglect and, and, and push down the road. And this is where, you know, primary care prevents more strokes certainly than the neurology does by helping with blood pressure. So that's really something that's important to do. Um, if you could change one thing after someone's had a stroke to prevent the next stroke, it would be modifying someone's blood pressure. And then the heart disease, especially atrial fibrillation. We can get patients who need to be on anticoagulation, on anticoagulation, um, find the AFib and do this, then that, that's especially important. Um, smoking, certainly, we all, we all know that um, is a risk factor. Heavy alcohol use, certainly, um, it leads mostly because it leads to high blood pressure, but it causes a lot of uh, damage as well. Obviously high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, and then sympo, uh, sympathomimetic drug use. So <laughs> a fancy word for meth and, and cocaine. Um, but, and there are other new things you guys are going to encounter that I'm trying to learn more about. And we're trying to figure out like Kratom. I, I don't know. Like we're, try, we're starting to try to find out about what kind of risks some of these other things that pose. Obviously synthetic marijuana, which is not marijuana at all. Um, you know, those kind of things we're still learning and, and understanding the role those play. But so I don't know about, about those things, uh, you know, synthetic marijuana or, or Kratom, but, you know, certainly, obviously, you know, cocaine or meth, but we all know those are, are not healthy. Um, so, you know, like I said, hypertension is the one thing if you wanted to really prevent the second stroke, you would, we would work on, would really work on. Smoking, obviously, um, you know, if you, your risk can get really close to baseline risk if you stop smoking. Um, if you have diabetes, obviously good uh, blood pressure, I mean, uh, blood sugar control. And then, um, you know, high cholesterol. If we put you on a, you know, the statin to control that, and it's, the goal is different after you've had a stroke, it's less than 70 LDL. And then uh, with atrial fibrillation, the difference is, there's a higher risk of bleed, of course, and, and we know that. But the difference between the second stroke when you have AFib or primary prevention, actually, with Coumadin and aspirin is, is dramatic. It's very dramatic. So that, that's another way we can do it. So uh, other things that are new that are really prevalent that, you know, increase risk for stroke, sleep apnea, um, you know, and we have a clinical trial, you know, that we're a part of through StrokeNet at, at Cox to help with this as well. So sleep apnea is one um, and uh, increased risk of stroke with patients with sleep apnea. Um, 
you know, and it, this is something that affects your health beyond just stroke. You know, it, it affects your health globally, but we really, um, we really try to focus on that one as well. Less common lipoprotein A. Um, this is something that's uh, a little, a little less common. We check for in certain populations who continue to have strokes and heart attacks, especially in their family, uh, and we haven't found it a reason for it. Um, and uh, we will uh, probably all it needs to be said about that one. If they if they keep having strokes and they have that, we'll figure it out and take care of it. So primary prevention for strokes, um, identify and control the risk factors and really get people to buy into controlling blood pressure, <clears throat> focusing on the things they can before they get a stroke. Secondary prevention, um, we need to find the cause, large vessel, small vessel, cardioembolic, and then figure it out and then, you know, obviously if they have a carotid and need surgery, that needs to happen. If they have AFib, they need anticoagulation. Um, and then identify and treat all the risk factors. And that's what our workup is about. And so we'll help with blood pressure, uh, diabetes, smoking cessation, um, diet, nutrition. Everybody that comes into my stroke clinic, I talk about the six top things you can do to prevent the next stroke. And you go in order, you know, blood pressure. Are you on anticoagulation, antiplatelet, number two? Are you on a statin, number three? You smoking number four, um, and then nutrition just in general, and then exercise number six, and I think all those things we have to deal with as well. <clears throat> and then so, you know, those are the things we we work on. And this, these are some maps of uh, of <laughs> of uh, the rate of uh, obesity. You know, and uh, starting back in 1988, and uh, you know, didn't have a lot of data actually in 1988 on this. Couldn't even get it, but obviously you, you can see the trend, and this is something we all know about, um, and and so we all have to kind of work on this. Um, and and obviously, you know, Missouri is is very dark in that last one in terms of the darker has the higher rate of obesity. But this is pretty much occurring across the country. This is something that's been talked about at length, so I won't go into it too much more. But this is something we, we got to, you know, we, we don't need to beat people up about it, but be there to help them uh, in our communities and in our families and, and when we see them in practice as well. Obviously, this is the most recent one, um, you know, here. And then you can see certainly greater than 35%. And, and it's not just Missouri. It's, it's large swaths of the country. And that was 11 years ago. So, um, you know, in terms of the rest of these slides, you know, just to reiterate TPA um, and then the Dawn trial. But then this is a little more into thrombectomy here. I'll cut to this, you know, to understand why this is important, because this is such a new thing, it may bear some further discussion. So the reason why a th a thrombectomy works and how we evaluate this is there's what we call usually with these patients an ischemic core. There's an area of stroke that's occurred that cannot be cannot be uh, fixed, but there may be an area that's tissue at risk that's giving us symptoms that could resolve, and that's what we call a penumbra, just meaning tissue that's at risk but hasn't died yet. And so essentially, you have a blood clot that's b blocking the blood flow, but collateral vessels, meaning the vessels that don't normally take that blood there are getting enough blood to keep the tissue alive for a little while, for a little while, but they will fail eventually. And so, you know, this is once again, the same slide of the Dawn summary here. But, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, the time after this increases the risk of hemorrhage. That's why it's not just up to 24 hours. You want to get them as soon as possible. If you do a thrombectomy at 23 hours, you obviously have more area that's probably stroked out that area is at an increased risk of, of bleeding. So even if we do a thrombectomy, the more core infarct there is, the more risk of, of a hemorrhage and, and hurting that person. So we want to be very careful. And also those vessels are in worse shape, so just putting a catheter into them can cause some problems. Um, so this is you know, kind of important for you guys here. So, um, or, no, sorry, the post-stroke medical management. So now let me talk about pre-stroke a little bit and what people will do often. So what I see some people do in patients will say, yeah, I thought they were having a stroke, so we gave them four aspirins, you know, and they swallowed those. We we'll try to tell people not to do that because when this first comes on, you don't actually know whether it's a bleed 
or a blood clot stroke until you get a scan of the brain. So we try to caution people, you know, don't necessarily, <laughs> with a heart attack, it's fine, you know, that's, you know, that's what you do, I suppose. But with a stroke, we don't know whether it's bleeding or blood clot until we get a CT scan. So don't, they don't need to take, you know, that aspirin um, in that case. And then certainly we can let the blood pressure go up to 185 if we see them beforehand. So, and then after a stroke, what we manage is we try to keep their blood pressure normal. Um, and try to avoid, you know, we try to keep their glucose normal. We try to keep, keep them from having a fever. And then pneumonia is a pretty common complication. Okay. And then, um, you know, our initial evaluation we talked about, we get a brain scan of some kind. We get an ultrasound of the heart. We get an ultrasound of the, the blood vessels in the neck. And then we monitor their heart rhythm on telemetry looking for atrial fibrillation. And sometimes we'll do a little more uh, advanced testing with uh, TTE or a conventional angiogram, which I showed you a picture of earlier. And then if it's a really, you know, a young patient or high risk, we may do some more, um, you know, extensive workup, certainly. And for us, a young patient is less than 65. You know, our, our patient population is pretty, pretty old. And then, you know, sometimes, and this is why the TIAs are often important, is if someone has a, a TIA or multiple TIAs, they may have a carotid artery that's got a substantial blockage. Um, and so, you know, we, we can refer this patient, figure that out, refer them, decide whether they need pretty strong medical therapy or whether they may need an intervention. And we can get that done in the hospital pretty quickly. Um, and so that's another reason to evaluate them quickly. And then they can sometimes get stenting as well if they can't get a surgery, if they're a high surgical risk. This may all change in the next few years. We have a clinical trial called CREST-2 that should complete in the next few years. And it's comparing medical therapy to stenting to endarterectomy, and it'll be really the best trial for that. So as of now, all three of those things are on the table depending on the patient. And you can see here in this, patient, this picture how, um, how narrow that carotid is there. And that, don't, that causes a problem not only because it could stop the blood flow in its entirety, but whenever you get a very narrowed vessel from, uh, for whatever reason, usually atherosclerosis, you know, you get blood flow that's not going straight through it, it becomes turbulent. And even the, the geometrical configuration of the plaque, like if it's uneven and it's not even not a high-grade stenosis, the blood's not flowing straight through there. So it will kind of swirl and eddy. And you can see this on ultrasound. And then it will cause a blood clot to, to be created. And then the blood clot will go to the brain. And then it can do that again. Or, or a piece of the plaque can break off, you know. So, so that you think about TIAs, you think about that's often what happens, we think of especially in certain distributions. And, and that's something that needs to be, to be dealt with quickly because the next time it does, it could be, could be catastrophic. Okay, and yeah, there's an after picture and you can see how much better that carotid looks after the stent has been placed. And so usually, you know, within two weeks is the time frame for these, but in some patients, we really need to do this faster than we do get that done. Um, and then, um, you know, secondary prevention, you know, this is, um, that's important for you guys, but to, to understand, you know, really um, need to be on an aspirin, Plavix, or if they need, um, you know, anticoagulation. And this is just a slide kind of showing you um, how that works. Um, and then, you know, this is it. And so a patient who has a stroke, more likely to have a second stroke. So it, the other piece of information that's good to get is, hey, are they on, certainly if they're on blood thinners, it's important for us to know in the acute setting because those are sometimes contraindications to TPA. The, what we call the DOACs or direct or oral anticoagulants like Eliquis or Xarelto, Pradaxa, if they've had those in the past 48 hours, they can't get TPA. Coumadin, we can still give them TPA if their INR is below a certain goal. Even patients on a heparin drip, if, they're, if their PTT is below a certain goal, we can give it. So we can still give TPA to patients on warfarin if they're, and it often is, their INR is, is below 1.7. So it's good to know if they're on those things. It's also good for us to know what antiplatelets they're on uh, to, to decide what to do, you know, after that. Um, and so these are the, the, the reasons why someone might be on anticoagulation uh, for, for stroke, you know. Um, you know, cardioembolic, obviously AFib, mechanical aortic valve, severe cardiomyopathy, and if they have a hypercoagulable disorder, arterial dissection or a venous sinus thrombus. Um, and then so what we do is we try to figure out why they have the stroke, whether it's large or small vessel, whether it's cardioembolic or unknown, and then we decide on these, these options, either antiplatelet or anticoagulation.
but they all would need one of those two. And so uh, who recovers from a stroke? You know, age obviously is very important. Very large stroke, even in a young patient, um, they will do relatively well. The brain just responds better and they tend to have other different comorbidities than older patients. But I would say uh, it's, in some ways it's becoming less important because we will see, very frequently see 90 year olds who are living on their own and don't have hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, any of those things. And we see very frequently uh, a 45 year old who has all of those risk factors. Um, and so, you know, we, we're careful to take that individual into account because, you know, age at this point, there can be very, very different uh, people phenotypically depending on their age, even if they're the same age. How big the stroke is obviously is a problem. Location is very important for prognosis. Brain stem strokes have a much worse prognosis. Um, and then the mechanism of the stroke. Small vessel strokes tend to, to, have, uh, to have a better prognosis. And then obviously comorbidities. And then, like I said, we can prevent strokes. Um, that's what we can do. We can treat them acutely, really, to, we're still talking about preventing them. Um, but we can't make anybody better. So rehab is very important. And so help, helping make sure everybody gets rehab. And, and a, a large percentage of patients who have a stroke don't, don't get the rehab they do. We're, try, we're trying to work every day on making this better and getting them the rehab they need. And uh, it's really important. Imagine a patient, and I see this frequently, is a patient who had a stroke, they have AFib, they're on Eliquis, and maybe they didn't get therapy, something fell through the cracks. Uh, <laughs> last week I saw, for example, a patient, you know, comes in, uh, outline area, had a stroke, is on Eliquis, is falling every day, has a big goose egg on his head. He's walking around with a cane he made himself out of driftwood and is falling all the time. This is a, this is a disaster waiting to happen um, to this guy. So rehab is extremely important and this is what gets people better from strokes. The neurologist never made anybody better after a stroke. They prevent them. But physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, these are the people who are in there doing this, getting people better. So we really make it an emphasis to get people what they need. And once again, timing matters, right? We talked about Kairos. The timing of rehab is important. It needs to be up front. You can get somebody a year after a stroke and give them all the rehab you want. They will not have the same response. We really need this to be acute. And so we focus uh, very heavily on this. So that's essentially where we go. So we will, uh, probably that's as far as we need to go uh, for there. So hopefully this was useful to you. Um, and uh, if there are any questions you guys have specifically, I'd be happy to address those. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. I appreciate it. Um, just, uh, it's, it's a real privilege to have you come here and Thank give you. these lectures uh, to us. I think it's, uh, it's enabled us to have access to uh, to some of the, the really top level physicians that we have at the hospital that, that are able to uh, provide just excellent education that we haven't had opportunity to have before that's going to make us better in what we do. Sure. Um, if we have any questions uh, coming through, looks like we have one. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe your YouTube channel. Um, was that what you were asking? Okay. Uh, no questions. All right. Thanks, okay. Dr. Lott. Yeah, thank you very that much. wraps up our certs education for today. And thank you, everybody.